Hi, this is Rich Walcott, longtime Bay Area sportscaster with Trevor Tierney, who is the head of Delta Developmental. He was a Princeton NCAA champion lacrosse goalie, was an indoor league champion lacrosse goalie, and a world pro league champion. So you got the trifecta there, uh, Trevor, and now you're working to help people get a better sense of getting in the zone and achieving peak performance. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rich. Uh, Honor to talk with you and, and uh, dive into some of the things I'm working with on uh, with athletes and coaches. Yeah, well, why don't you start with your genesis as an athlete? I think you told me uh, you were born with a lacrosse stick in your hands. Your dad was your coach at Princeton. Uh, quite an honor and achievement to carry it so far in your career as an athlete. Yeah, my, my dad has been a lacrosse coach um, my entire life. Uh, he's a Hall of Fame lacrosse coach, won six national championships at Princeton and one uh, at University of Denver now. Um, so I, I was always surrounded by um, athletics and his teams and just always looked up to the guys um, that he was coaching as I was growing up. And, you know, I was born, born my first baby picture. I have a stick in my hand. And so athletics has always been a, a huge, impactful part of my life that um, has really made me who I am and, and, you know, made me think about how I can bring those same lessons on to the younger kids and, and coaches that I work with today. Well, obviously, being a, being a champion on so many levels, I just think about lacrosse as one of the most fierce games, the, the old uh, Native American Indian games, the Iroquois uh, on Long Island, where I grew up would play that game for days and I think one tribe would win and the other tribe would die. So, I mean, th this was truly life or death and, and you've got to have nerves of steel. I was a soccer goal at the University of Connecticut and I thought taking a, a soccer ball at 90 miles an hour was hard, but they're flinging darn, darn near rocks at you all the time in goal. <laughs> yeah, uh, to your first point, I, I'm uh, you know eternally grateful to the Native Americans for sharing their game with us. And I really believe it's uh, the best game in the world. It's not the most popular game uh, yet, I always like to say, but I think it's a dynamic game. It's physical, it's fast, it has finesse. Um, it's a lot of fun to play and watch. And, um, you know, it, it was originated in, in North America, which I, I, you know, find a lot of pride in. And, and as I said before, I'm thankful to the Natives uh, Americans for sharing it with us. Um, yeah, playing goalie is, is a little bit crazy. You, you don't wear a lot of pads in outdoor field goalie. Um, you get hit with the ball a lot, and um, it, it takes a lot of presence and focus to be really dialed in and uh, just be you know in the zone and, and ready to react as best as you can to 90, 100, 115 mile per hour uh, fastballs getting thrown at you, and, and you just got to stop it from going in a six by six net. So um, to me, it was always a really challenging and fun position and a fun sport to play. Um, and, and also grew up playing some, some football and, and hockey along the way. Um, so just, just, you know, for me, it's, it's not just about lacrosse. It's about all sports and, and um, what athletes get, get from the sport they play in and, and, and reaching that high level of mastery um, in, in whichever game they choose to play. And you talk about getting into the zone. And one of the common mantras of our mutual friend, Scott Ford, is getting into the zone by choice and not chance. And I'd like you to expound upon that. Yeah, um, I've known Scott for about uh, 15 years and was, uh, became a great mentor in my life. Um, at the time when I met him, was really struggling in a professional lacrosse to catch up with the speed of the ball and was going through um, a bit of a slump there. And he helped me kind of see, uh, learn to see the ball in a different way and learn to get myself ready um, for games in a different way. And, you know, every time, before I started working with Scott, it was like every time I went into a game, it was like, well, I hope I'm gonna be good or, <laughs> you know, or, or I'm gonna be bad. You know, there was no, I had confidence, but I didn't know as a goalie, it was such a hard position. I didn't know how things were going to go. And after I started working with Scott, I knew um, the things that I was in control of. And that was um, kind of letting go 
of um, you know the uh, opposing players, the field conditions, um, the types of shots they were throwing at me, you know how well my teammates were playing, letting go of all that, and just learning to relax my eyes and kind of focus on what Scott calls the window um, about three feet in front of me and um, really waiting for the ball um, to hit that window and, and react as quick as possible. And so this is something that I teach goalies now on a continual basis. And it's pretty cool because when I met Scott, you know, he didn't know the first thing about lacrosse. He had never even heard about it, but, you know, he knew how to teach um, a goalie or any any athlete for that matter how to react to a ball and how to get in the zone and so it's something that I really enjoy um, working with young athletes with today because um, there's nothing uh, more satisfying than seeing a young athlete you know eight or nine years old just get completely in the flow of what he's doing um, in the game that he's playing so um, you know, I'm, I'll always be uh, grateful for having Scott in my life and the things he's taught me along the way. You know, you hear so much about athletes being hyper focused, but it's actually a bit of a counterintuitive concept to recognize that it's the soft eyes and the relaxed mentality that will engender the best peak performance opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I got to try it on a really cool tool um, up in a, a sports training facility in, in Northern California uh, about a month ago or so. Basically, it was a wall um, with lights all over it. And what they had you do was um, there was a blue rectangle right in the middle of the wall that they would put right in front of your eyes. And you would kind of relax your eyes on that blue rectangle and then hit the lights as they were coming up all over the wall. And so, um, you know, I hope to be able to invest in one of those walls one day to work with athletes because it it's really the best way to explain to people, this is how you re learn how to relax your eyes and you're just um, using your peripheral vision to kind of react. Because I think what we do, um, and this goes for everything we do, when we're driving down the road, we kind of um, focus on other cars or... Um, any anytime we're sitting around at a desk, we can focus on different things and look at objects uh, in the real world. And we don't really learn how to see everything that's going on. And so what I, what I think athletes do when they get in the zone is they kind of accidentally um, fall into the space where their eyes are relaxed, their body's relaxed, they're feeling really confident, and they're seeing everything that's going on. And that's why you hear about things uh, going into slow motion and feeling like they were connected to the other team um, and all these kind of things that sound really, um, you know, quote unquote spiritual. And really it just, it comes down to them being really relaxed and really present and being able to see everything. And so, um, you know, Scott can teach you and, and, and now fortunately from learning from him, I, I can teach goalies how to get in that space more uh, regularly. So what are some of the practices that you uh, either suggest, coach, or implement? Um, so, you know, the easiest drill that I have young goalies do is, um, well, the first thing I, I have them do is in a hockey rink type atmosphere where there's glass uh, on, on the boards. Um, or there's even indoor soccer facilities, even better, that go glass from the, from the um, turf all the way up to, you know, six, seven, eight feet high. And I get goalies right on the glass and have them put their lacrosse stick out on the glass and just, just see what that's like to have um, that window out in front of them. Once I get them to see or have that feel of having a window in front of them and what that looks like, uh, I get them in the goal and then have them work on uh, seeing shots in different areas. Um, so what we call stick side high in lacrosse is where, where my stick is to uh, a high shot in the goal. Um, and we just do some stick side high shots and have them say yes when the ball hits the window. And what that trains them to do is they're saying yes um, to the contact point of that. So if you were to cover a ball and paint, um, and that ball hits the window and splatters in paint, you would be saying yes exactly when that ball hit that imaginary window. And what that really trains um, young athletes to do is be 
present on what the point that they need to react to rather than, um, you know, focusing out on the ball uh, in, this, in, in, in the coach's stick or the player's stick. Um, you know, that, that is kind of in the future because um, out, if you're seeing five, ten yards away, it's taking time for that light of that ball to get to your eye. You're actually looking into the future, as Scott would explain. And I'm always blown away by this talk every time Scott gives it. I've heard it a million times, but I'm like, wow, that's amazing. It, you're actually looking into the future when you're looking at an object that's you know, uh, uh, far away from you, maybe 10 yards away from you. And then, um, and then teaching them to kind of get that timing down of saying yes when the ball hits the window, um, not too early and not too late. And uh, it doesn't take long uh, for a young athlete to, to start to pick it up and really get it. Um, I think older athletes actually have more trouble that, uh, with it than, than younger athletes because they, they have their own patterns that they're kind of um, embedded with. Yeah, so you have to break old habits. Where, now, you deal with and, and coach a lot of young kids. And some of the, some of the uh, well, the, the paradigm shift from the, you know, go get them guys and the rah-rah speeches and some of the mentality of old school coaching versus some of the more enlightened views that are now prevalent in a lot of the youth coaching circles. So why don't you just expound a little bit upon, on that score? Yeah, I, I think there's kind of, um, there's two extremes in, in athletics um, in our society. I think you have this uh, overly competitive, um, transactional type coaching where it's win at all costs and we have to do anything we can, whether it's cheat or, you know, do, do whatever we need to do to win the game. That's the most important thing in the world. And, um, you know, it, it just seeps into the culture, whether it's with the kids or parents or whoever is a part of that program or, or sport or team. Then you have, you know, more sports should just be fun. Um, everyone should just go out there and have a good time if they want to, you know, run around in the corner and pick daffodils. And if mom's bringing, you know, orange slices to the game, then great. And, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but, um, you know, how much are young athletes going to get at, get out of that? Um, I, I don't know. For me, you know, sports was kind of a combination of the two, or at least the way I'm seeing it now is that it's, it, it has to be kind of a mixture of um, cooperation and competition and, and a mixture of um, transactional and transformational coaching where sports, the, the, the competition that we have in sports is a great hurdle for us to try to push ourselves to get better, to succeed as a team. And, and grow and develop as athletes and, and as, as communities. Um, at, at the same time, we, we should be have a, having a lot of fun doing it and we should be learning about ourselves in the process. So, you know, there's a really um, great book called Inside Out Coaching by Joe Ehrman, former NFL player uh, within, uh, not Indianapolis Colts, I think he was with the Baltimore Colts at the time, but um, Coach Ehrman talks a lot about transactional versus transformational coach, coaching, where coaches uh, who are transformational coaches really see the value in competition and hope that their athletes um, learn something about themselves and become great leaders for their communities uh, through that process of really pushing themselves competitively. Whereas transactional coaching, uh, like I was saying before, is strictly focused on the win. Um, and, and not a whole lot else. So um, I think we can kind of take those two extremes and, and find a middle ground to really utilize uh, sport as a great educational and developmental opportunity for uh, young athletes. Yeah, that's well said. And you know, I coached my sons in Little League, and I remember there were so many coaches who would do anything to win with 10 year olds. And I remember heading into a playoff game for the kids and I said, who hasn't pitched, who hasn't played shortstop? And I said, would you guys like to shuffle it up and roll the dice? And the team voted in favor of that. I probably should have done it earlier on. But the whole idea was if you're 11 years old and you've never pitched before and you don't do it now, when will you? If you've always dreamed of that, right. why do you allow kids to have that experience and that joy at what price? I mean, so you don't 
win the game and go to the playoffs. The kids didn't care about that as much as having the experience. So if you can just appreciate the experience for what it is and the opportunity over the end result, better it, it's better for all concerned. Yeah, and, and you make a great point because at 10 or 11 years old, there are different um, developmental challenges and, and requirements for those children to, to get better as athletes and, and learn more about themselves for them to, uh, you know, mix up positions and have fun with different positions and try new things out. It's going to make them a better athlete when they start uh, you know, if they decide to go down the road of specializing. So um, th these are some of the things, there's no uh, one way for every athlete and every team and every age, but um, just thinking about these things in a more developmental context and having a longer term view like you did with, with those kids, I think is, is the main, uh, should be the main drive. Yeah, I think that's the, be the better takeaway. A few years from now, they won't remember who won or lost that playoff game, but the memory of having pitched maybe the only time in their little league lives, in their, own, their lives ever, that would be something they can carry to the grave as a great experience. So tell me a little bit more about getting team sports, a team sports mentality where the individual has to kind of subsume his personal agenda for the benefit of all and how it really transcends the growth for that young person beyond the ball field? Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting question. I, when you look around at um, athlete interviews or coach interviews, everyone within sports can kind of talk the, the team game. Um, so they say, well, I, you know, I, I just really wanted to do it for the team and, and I'm just glad we got the win. And, and, and you know, it's really, um, it's really important that they're actually making meaning that way. Like, are they putting, um, are they putting uh, others before self or, or are they putting their own kind of wants, needs, desires uh, first? And I think a lot of times um, in sport, we, we tend to coach, uh, coach in a way or set up sports in a way where it's actually – um, driven by the individual we you know we give trophies and award individual awards and you know kids either get to play or get sit on the bench and so a, a lot of what we're kind of unconsciously telling kids is yeah we talk about the team but really it, it's about you being the best you can be I think if we started to really um, when we build a team or we build a program we really focus on community first and team first and, and, and teaching kids what it means to uh, put their teammates before themselves. So, you know, uh, if, if a kid comes into or a young student athlete comes into a coach and says, hey, coach, what do I have to do to be on a field? You know, I would reframe, reframe that conversation as a coach of what do I have to do um, to help my team uh, be great? And if that includes being on the field, then great. If, it, if it, that includes being an awesome practice player, then, then that is, is good too. We, we all want to do well individually, but I think one of the great lessons that sport can teach uh, young, young athletes is um, really how to put others before self um, because that is what it, what it takes to be a great leader for the community. And then on top of that, you know, I would say, how can we how can we help athletes become really mission driven and um, start to think bigger picture about uh, what they want to bring into their communities and what their their values and their mission are to make a difference as leaders in their communities when they get done athletes. So we're not just asking um, athletes to fall in line and just be good team players and just listen to the coach. We're also asking them to um, develop themselves so that they can bring their own dreams and their own vision um, out into the real world. So there's a, there's a number of different steps that we can take uh, developmentally as uh, adults in the sports world helping young athletes grow. Now, we're, t we're talking prim uh, primarily about team sports, but what about an individual sport? 
like a tennis or running or things where you are singularly on your own yeah. in your endeavor in competition. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I talk and work with a lot of uh, coaches, um, at in college coaches that work with individual athletes, individual sports. And, and it, it's interesting talking to them because um, they do some really great things around um, building team. It's almost like because they realize they're an individual sport, they're really focused on bringing um, their teams together in different ways that most team sports don't think about. So um, there's a skiing, skiing coach I know that, you know, has his players kind of help each other out on the ski lift or on the rides home from the mountains where they're watching each other's uh, film and, and and giving each other pointers. So giving each other challenge and praise and feedback. And, and that's a really great practice that uh, you could use in individual sports or team sports, but finding ways, um, no matter what it is, you're always going to be in some sort of community. I, I have a friend that, uh, you know, started a running club just so that, yeah, you're running individually, but you're coming together as a group of people um, to run uh, as a community, as a group, and, and, and come together collectively on, on some different things. So I don't think it's limited to just team sports. Yeah, I mean, there are certain universalities that, that apply, whether it's uh, one person solo or uh, a group of individuals uh, making a collective team. All right, you've got a, a master's in psychology from Harvard, and you talk about how that impacted you with your flow dynamics and in, in, in how, uh, how, how you conjure up that reference point to all this discussion. Yeah, so I'm still working on my master's. I'm, I'm, I'm in the research phase of my master's thesis, so I'm getting close. Um, hopefully I graduate this, this spring. Um, it's, been a, it's been a long, challenging, uh, great learning process for me. Um, and, uh, you know, along the way, uh, I started a small consulting firm out here in Colorado called Delta Developmental, and, and, and the practices that we use to help um, both executive organizations and athletic teams are what we call uh, flow dynamics. And, and flow dynamics are, are tools or practices or exercises that uh, help teams uh, develop uh, themselves as, as groups and, and as people along the way. So uh, we're, we're talking things like uh, communication skills, uh, individual coaching, um, diversity training, um, and, and so a lot of the different thing, uh, lead, leadership assessments, these type of things that, that kind of, um, uh, push, push these groups to, to develop themselves in, in different ways so that they can uh, meet the capacities of, of the field that they're working in. So, um, you know, the, the, the professor that I got to learn, uh, from and, and really respect at Harvard is, uh, Dr. Robert Keegan who is kind of a forefather uh, in adult development. And, and so really, I, I, I have great respect for his um, kind of framework of how we grow as adults or, or don't grow in a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways uh, sometimes. Uh, so the thing, so people kind of get the notion that uh, childhood development, every kid goes through um, specific stages of development as they age. And we kind of think that when we be, get to adulthood, we're done growing physically, so we must be done growing um, in all other ways. But the fact of the matter is we continue to grow as adults cognitively, emotionally, um, behaviorally, and spiritually. And so, um, you know, Dr. Keegan and, and a lot of his PhD students have found out how to kind of measure, measure this and assess this in adults and um, kind of lay out how, how we grow as individuals. And it gives, it gives um, I, I find it really helpful in everything that I do to kind of give me a lens and understand people uh, at a deeper level. You know, you're making such wonderful points about a whole change in the paradigm about coaching, about living, about experiencing sports. And it, it, it's sort of a, a higher consciousness and the more selfless, we think and believe and act, the more we contribute to the general good. And it, and it goes beyond the ball field, as you point out in your work with corporations and 
you know, companies and the like. So just expound upon that if you could, Trevor. Sure. So uh, kind of the stages of, of adult development uh, in, in most simple terms are uh, we, ha we have uh, kind of the first, well, it's actually second stage. It's, it's a stage that we should probably grow through or, or mature through at around 11, 12 or 13 years old. Unfortunately, a fair amount of our population of adults um, stays kind of stuck in, stuck in it through adulthood. And you see um, a lot of narcissism, uh, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of psychological issues, um, addiction issues uh, in adults that are in the self-sovereign stage where um, people make meaning in their world around getting their own needs, wants, and desires met. And really, that's how they see the world in a very kind of instrumental way. Um, the second, the, the third stage of development is a socialized uh, stage of development where a person makes meaning around being part of a group. Um, so I'm, I'm one group or I'm the other, and I believe in this uh, leader or external authority uh, figure. Um, and a, a, you know, a fair, probably 50% of our population is, uh, is kind of making most of their life meaning around this socialized group. You see this in a lot of uh, ways in our world if you just open the newspaper I'm Republican or I'm Democrat I believe this I believe that and it's like uh, we get very black and white in that stage and we we really rely on outside voices to tell us what to think um, for 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 us to really thrive as adults um, in a lot of contexts or at least more complex contexts um, you know it for, for, for adults to get to mature to the next stage of development, which is self-authored stage, or what I like to call mission-driven, is where adults really kind of make meaning around their own mission, their own principles, their own, own values. And some people see, accidentally mistake these two, that this stage for the lower level um, self-sovereign stage of it being selfish. Um, so it, it's interesting to watch this, um, this national anthem controversy right now, because you're seeing a lot of people say, um, so there's these athletes kind of taking a stand for what they believe um, is important to them. And they're trying to have a voice in something outside of sports. And people are saying, well, that's really selfish of them. And it's like, well, no, they're, they're actually standing for something they believe in, in, in their community. It doesn't mean that they don't care about their team anymore. It doesn't mean that they don't respect their coach anymore. They're just kind of expanding on their complexity and meaning making in, in the world and, and um, showing that, having an a, a, uh, external um, kind of symbol of that in a way. And whether or not you agree with that, it's, it, it's still a more complexity than we typically see in athletics. So I think it's been a really interesting thing uh, to watch lately. And then finally, you have um, a, a fifth stage of development, uh, a self-transformational stage where you're really talking about, uh, it's almost like, it, it seems to me like living in the zone. I'm not, I'm not living in the space, but you're talking about really uh, mature, wise uh, elders and spiritual leaders that make meaning in this way and, you know, can kind of uh, transmit information to us in different ways than we're typically used to. And um, yeah, so the, there, there are these various stages that we can kind of grow through. We can go, we can go in and out of them depending on the space we're in. You know, sometimes I notice myself around old buddies or old friends or maybe my brothers and sisters and we maybe regress back to a certain space or context can ask us to expand ourselves and really show up in different ways. So that's not um, static stages like we talk about in childhood development. I kind of like to think of them as, as kind of bubbles or circles that we can kind of expand in and out of. Um, but uh, people have different centers of gravity d depending on uh, you know, their own, their own uh, growth and development throughout their life. Yeah, and, and as you evolve through these stages, can you just talk about how to facilitate those transitions and some of the tools and mechanisms that you do in coaching and in teaching? Yeah, the, the, the first thing is always, 
um, does a person or does a team want to um, grow and develop? You know, it's not, uh, it's not really my decision to make, uh, to, you know, force anyone to, to grow in any way. Um, so that, that's really the, the first key is, is, is does someone um, want to expand their capacities and their, their ability to um, have greater complex, complexity uh, on those different levels of cognitive, behavioral, um, emotional, and, and spiritual levels. Um, the second thing is, is kind of, you know, what's the context that you're in? Um, certain contexts may not be asking you to, to um, be making meaning in, 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 in more complex ways. And that's why, um, actually, as athletes and coaches, we have to be, I think, we really have to be conscious of, of the meaning making we're placing on sports to athletes. Because if we're just saying it's just about winning, then we're going to keep those athletes stuck in a very uh, simple way of meaning uh, of meaning making and it's not going to um it's not going to encourage their growth on the on the other hand if we if we make it about hey this is a context for you to grow and develop as leaders for your communities 20 30 years down the road then we're we're opening up possibilities for them so i think the the big thing is to keep it simple and, uh, you know, I can geek out on developmental <laughs> talks all day long, and, and some of my friends can as well. But um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, as you said before, how are we helping um, usher young people from just, just seeing things on a very individual level to how can I really put my teammates and coaches first and foremost to how can I care about the community around, around me and my parents and my friends and people that I go to school with and teachers. And I think if we can just start to see things in that way, we can utilize sport to, to be a great developmental context. You know, James Harrison, the star linebacker of the Steelers, was outraged when his young son came back with a participation trophy. And he didn't want to hear anything about that. You know, either do your best or don't bring that kind of thing home. And obviously with social media being so powerful, a tool, and, and unfortunately maybe even a weapon, there is, a, there is, a, there is a, a drive to be front and center, the high achiever, the one who won the most, did the best. And how do you reconcile those two disparate kind of you know views on youth sports between just great to be here jimmy and uh if you don't win well winning isn't everything it's the only thing as vince lombardi said which is maybe all too prevalent in the eyes of many yeah i, I think one thing we forget to talk about it is failure in sports and how much youth athletes and, and coaches and all of us can learn from failure i, I know in your neck of the woods uh, where you live um, in Silicon Valley, they actually really value failure because they know if they fail enough times, they're kind of going to stumble upon something really successful. And so this is something I, I've been talking to a lot with, with the parents and, and youth players that I work with right now because, um, you know, I have tryouts for my youth and high school teams. And I hate I hate cutting kids. <laughs> you know, I, I love working with all these kids. I wish we could keep them all around. Um, but then at the end of the day, due to coaching time and field space and the tournaments we go to, we can only have um, so many teams and, and so many kids participate. So um, the, the thing that I really express to parents is like, it's okay uh, for kids to fail. It's okay for them to lose games. There's, there's kind of this push now where parents always try to find the best team uh, to play on. Um, I wrote a blog about this a while ago saying the best team may not be what's best for your kid. And uh, um, it, it was one of my first articles that really went viral. I think around 70,000 people read it. And it was, it, it, I think it really hit home for a lot of people because so many parents think it's, it's about finding the best team. That's how their kid's going to get a lot out of the sport. When actually um, you know, when I was growing up, I played on some terrible youth teams uh, in lacrosse. I played on uh, a high school that was just kind of starting to get going and get better in New Jersey. And we lost a lot of games and we got our butt, butts kicked a few times. 
And, and those losses uh, taught me a lot. And, and the most important thing that I think failure teaches young athletes is, is resilience. It's, it's the most safe environment where we can lose something as kids and as young people where it really means something to us. And yet um, nobody died, nobody got hurt. Uh, we didn't fail out of school. We're not getting thrown in jail. It, it's something that's really sad to us and really disappointing and brings up a lot of anger for us. And, and we have to learn to navigate that as young athletes. And I think uh, that is a really powerful experience that we, we tend to overlook in athletics for young people. Yes, and it may be true that we learn more in defeat and failure than we do in success and winning. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, we, we, there's so many lessons we can take from it. The most important thing in, in my eyes being uh, how do we cope? How do we get mentally tougher? And, and how do we keep trying regardless of whether we felt, failed or not? And it, it keeps us humble as human beings. I mean, it also, if we, my, my, my point to parents all the time is if you win, if you win all the time in sports, it's, it's not very fun. <laughs> you know, that, that's, the, that's the thing that, that makes sports fun is you're playing other teams that can beat you. And um, in youth sports, you can easily find ways to win every game. You can go to bad tournaments or, or, or find lower divisions to play in and, and win every game. But that, that is not the way to develop athletes and to have fun playing sports, at least in my mind. Trevor, this has been a blast. Thanks so much for sharing your great insights and continued success. And go get that master's from Harvard, big boy. Um, I'm working on it. Thanks, Rich, for your time. Appreciate it.